Hey everyone, as you know, if you are a follower of my channel, on this channel we typically um, talk about philosophical ideas, we try to tackle some philosophical concepts, and sometimes we do analysis and things like that. However, today I was having a look at one of Carl Jasper's books called Philosophy, and it occurred to me that I've never really sat down and talked to you guys about philosophy in general terms. There are big philosophical questions that are enticing, and that's what attracts philosophers to do philosophy. So early this morning I decided to talk to you guys freely about what comes to my mind. I'll try to focus on the first pages of the book I mentioned to orient myself. But as we go along, we might talk about different things. We will see how it turns out to be. I thought it might be a good idea to do a freestyle talk. I don't know, you might call it a podcast or whatever you wish. But it's not important what you want to call it. The important thing is that I felt like I wanted to talk to my audience and connect with them. So let's go. Sometimes when you are daydreaming or when you are lying awake uh, on your bed at night, you might think about really big questions. I mean, what is being? Or why is anything at all? Why isn't there nothing? Or to put it in simpler terms, why is there something rather than nothing? Or there might be questions concerning identity that might concern you, like who am I? what do I really want, or what does it mean to exist, what is consciousness, how is it that I am conscious of me, who is this me? Of course, every philosopher tries to approach these questions in different ways, depending on which uh, school of thought you follow or what your personality is, you will begin to tackle these questions in, diff in different manners. If you want to label it, I see myself as an existentialist and my approach is also in accordance with existentialism. Um, for an existentialist, I mentioned uh, Jaspers earlier, or we can say Heidegger. These questions are not without context. Jaspers would say uh, they come from a past, from a past uh, in which I found myself. Or for Heidegger, there is nothing that is without a context. Like when you ask anything or when you find yourself in a situation, uh, th that situation is kind of pre-given. There is already a context in which you are asking those questions. You always find yourself in a situation, as uh, these philosophers would say. I live in a world and for the most part, I had no saying in how my life turned out to be. You might think that you have free will and you've chosen your life always freely, but that's not really the case. If you really think about it, you realize that you don't choose the language you speak natively, you don't choose where you are born, you don't choose your personality traits, you don't choose your family, you don't choose many things in life. To put it simply, you cannot choose many things in life that really matter. You always find yourself in a situation that is pre-given. In any case, we find ourselves in situations that we don't fully understand because we don't have a control over them. And yet, we want to answer really big questions in those situations. When we are born, we begin living. And we don't really remember that first situation. We don't really remember anything about it. It's some sort of a darkness for us. And we have no idea how it's all going to end. And between these two points, bet uh, between birth and death, we find ourselves in many many situations and all we do is we hop from one situation to the next. This kind of hopping from one situation to the next is kind of a transformation. 
So the situation keeps transforming me as it transforms itself. Uh, it's kind of emotion that carries me from a darkness in which I did not exist to a darkness uh, in which I shall not exist. But notice something strange. Um, if we want to answer these questions, we cannot answer them objectively. What do I mean? There are philosophers like Wittgenstein or Carnap who would say that these questions, these big questions which I mentioned earlier, are really, uh, let's say, uh, let's call them pseudo questions. They are nonsensical. For instance, we can ask what's the structure of an atom. There is an objective way to find out what an atom is and what it is made of. But there is no objective way to answer the big questions. Because, in a sense, all these questions, these big questions uh, that you want answered, concerns you as a person, as a subject. There is a being who is asking these questions. So if you wish to answer these questions objectively, that could only mean that you should objectify yourself and put yourself among other things and view yourself as an object. But that's not what philosophy should be about. That because we are human beings, of course we are looking after being. If we lose the meaning of life, if we lose ourselves in trying to answer these questions, who cares what an atom is? Who cares how the universe works objectively? These questions are important so long as there is a, there is a subject, there is a being who is asking these questions. If you take that person out of the equation, then there is no point in asking these questions. Sure, there exists a universe, but who cares if that universe exists if I'm not here? The point about trying to answer questions scientifically is that you want to be able to predict and retrodict. So the more knowledge that you gain into the workings of the universe, the better you will be able to predict and retrodict. Uh, what do I mean? I mean, uh, when you have gained enough, let's say, knowledge in physics, you will be able to say how the universe originated, and you will also be able to say how the universe will end, or how it will look like in a million years, or whatever. That's a very general way of putting it. You can calculate how objects work in a universe if you are trying to answer these questions objectively. But to be a human being means something else. Of course, you may want to build a science out of psychology in a way to be able to calculate human behavior with extreme precision. But if you do so, you will lose something. What makes life interesting is that I don't know what's going to happen. I'm in the dark about what's going to happen next. There is some sort of a fear. Sometimes it scares us, but that's what makes us human. Other existentialists have the same opinion. For instance, Kierkegaard would tell you, it might be very comforting to meet someone who will tell you how your life will turn out to be, someone who will answer any question that you might have. But if that happened, your life wouldn't have any meaning, because there is no value in certainty. It's much more meaningful to take steps in uncertainty and embrace what shall come. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm an avid follower of science. I read scientific books ferociously. I know philosophy of science. And I think scientific method is the best possible method that we have. What I'm getting at here is something completely different. It has nothing to do with how valuable science is, and I'm not being unscientific. What I'm trying to say is that if we objectify human beings and if we turn them into elements of an equation, we lose meaning in life. 
It's really common sense. No one wants his life to be nothing more than just a number in, say, a statistician's book. We don't encounter such objections to objectifying only in existentialism. For instance, one big worry of uh, Marxists was precisely this. And I mean Marxists who had an appreciation for individuality like Adorno or Lukács. Of course, I don't mean every Marxist. For Lukács, the big threat of capitalism was that it kind of objectivizes people and turns them into equation. People are only valuable so long as you can uh, sell things to them or buy things from them or use them instrumentally. Such rational calculation that exists in capitalism excludes irrational aspects of life. Uh, by irrational, I mean those things that should be measured qualitatively. And of course, what gives our lives meaning are precisely these, these qualitative elements. And let's say you manage to objectify life. You manage to objectify every single person, you yourself included, and view life really scientifically. As you go along as such a dogmatic scientist, you will not be able to eradicate these questions for yourself. You will always ask these questions. You, uh, you will always want answers to these questions. At the very least, you will always be fearful of non-existence, of your death. Science is not going to be able to answer the questions you might have about death. Scientists observe the world in an empirical way and come up with hypotheses. You can observe people die, but in no way you will come closer to answering your questions about death by observing them. Because what matters uh, when you are afraid of death or when you want answers to your questions is that subjective feeling that only you as a person can have. So the narrated account of the fear of death that uh, you might get from other people will not suffice to satisfy uh, your curiosity. And that subjective feeling will differ for each person. Remember that I said that you always find yourself in a situation. That situation is pre-given. It has a historical context. It is a result of what came before in your life. It is rooted in your past. And of course, every person goes through a different history. So you might gain certain knowledge about death by observing other people. And let's say you will manage to know how they feel subjectively, but that in no way uh, will mean that you will understand what death means to you as a person, because of course you come uh, with a different background. Another crucial thing is that since we are beings, we have possibilities. There are many ways that our lives could turn out to be. Let's say that I'm worrying about death at this moment. But of course, because of the past that I had, and because of the person that I am now, there are different possibilities for me of how my life will turn out to be than there are for you. When scientists want to know how the universe works, they look for patterns. So if I observe that, if I kick a ball, it will move, or if I throw a stone, it will fly through the air, or if a billiard ball hits another ball, the second ball will move, then I might conclude that if object A inserts a force upon object B, then object B will move. Let's say that's my conclusion. The question is, is that a legitimate way of uh, looking for answers uh, in real life when human beings are concerned? Can I look at other people, observe the patterns, come up with an equation, and be satisfied with those answers that I get? Will this suffice? Sure, 
thanks to psychology and sociology, you will be able to find patterns. Nevertheless, when you as a person find yourself in a situation, these patterns would mean absolutely nothing. Your knowledge would amount to nothing. Because in specific situations that you are experiencing, things will start to have meaning that are important only to you. You might be able to find patterns objectively and scientifically, but when you are positioned in a situation, you cannot but help have subjective experiences, and these subjective experiences influence you. They matter. To give you a very simple example, I'm not just a philosopher. I've also studied musicology. Sure, I can look at a musical score and analyze what I see objectively. I might write essays and find patterns in a certain composer's compositions. Nevertheless, what I come up with will in no way compare with the subjective feeling that I have when I listen to Bach. That subjective experience is only for me. I can't write it down, I can't describe it, and I can't explain it scientifically. Of course, putting objectivity aside would not shed light on anything. I'm not denying that. When you stand in a situation, you see other situations and past situations, and that's all there is to it. Your view always ends in obscurity, as Jaspers would say. This might sound a bit bleak, because the world, with all its knowable premises and historical realities, uh, cannot help you understand your situation. But neither can your situation enable you to understand the world. Nevertheless, the point of uh, philosophy is not to shed light on your situation, because uh, as we have said, your situation is always changing. It is transforming, and uh, while it is being transformed, it transforms you as well along with it. So a philosophy that tries to shed light on your situation is always in flux because your situation is ever-changing. So to distinguish philosophy from science, philosophy will always remain incomplete, because there is no complete philosophical account that would apply to every single situation. A complete philosophical account would be like a scientific account that would make everything about our life deducible based on a few facts. That's all for today. If you like what you've listened to, please leave a comment and let me know whether I should upload more videos like this. Lastly, I would like to remind you that I have a page on Patreon. If you find my videos worthy, any support would be highly appreciated. If it is somehow difficult for you to use Patreon, let me know and I'll set up a PayPal account. It's always encouraging for me to make more videos when I see someone pledging on Patreon. Thank you for listening.